Hello, and welcome to KDAB News, the monthly update for professionals working with Qt, C++, and 3D technologies. I'm Robert Brock, and today we have the following topics. First, there is an interview with KDAB CEO Kala Dalheimer on the recent discussion about Qt commercial and open source licenses. Beta release of KDE Plasma Big Screen, an open source UI for smart TVs. Qt for MCU 1.1 release. How crowdsourced 3D printing helps support local healthcare. Then, finally, some announcements and resource tips. As you may have noticed recently, there have been some rumours about Qt Company's plans for commercial licences and how that could affect the open source licences. In order to give you some background information on this process, I'll be talking to Kala Dalheimer, the founder and CEO of KDAB. Hello Kala, thank you for being with us. There has recently been some discussion around possible changes to Qt's licensing and development model. Can you give our viewers some background, please? Of course, Robert. So Qt was originally developed by first Trolltech, then Nokia, then Digia, then the, the Qt company. And it's been a, an, a collaborative effort almost from day one together with the community. And uh, KDAB have always been uh, the most significant external contributor. And the KDE project was one of the first users of Qt at all, and it's still uh, by far the largest user of Qt. So open governance and the open source model have been a huge uh, success factor for Qt. Um, many, many hands to help, many, many eyeballs to find bugs, uh, to find security holes, uh, just uh, make for a faster evolution. And the founders of Trolltech, the original developers of Qt, realized this, and they had the foresight to protect the availability of Qt for open source software by way of the KDE Free Qt Foundation. So recently, there have been negotiations between the KDE Free Qt Foundation and the Qt company about some uh, changes or updates to their mutual agreements. And uh, these negotiations seem to have stalled and uh, gone sour. There seems to be a lot of contention between the parties. Um, according to a representative or to representatives from the KDE project, the Qt company threatens to restrict the OSS versions, the open source versions, to releases that are one year delayed after the uh, commercial releases. I have to say, so far, for us, this is only secondhand information, but if this is true, it would mean an end to open governance, which would be very unfortunate uh, for, uh, for us at KDAP, for the Qt ecosystem, and for Qt, the tool and the product itself. Yes, yeah, of course. So what does this mean for the Qt ecosystem, and how are people impacted? Well, projects like uh, KDE, um, QGIS, a um, Qt-based uh, geo-information system, and VLC, the Video Land Video Player, all rely on uh, prompt updates, prompt releases, uh, in particular, of course, when it comes to security fixes, but also in general. These projects are crucial for the continued growth of Qt. They, the developers learn often Qt on, while working on some open source project, and then when they later go get a, a, a paid daytime job, they will introduce Qt there. So this is, these projects are not just excellent test beds, but also um, a great way of disseminating knowledge about Qt into the world. And I should also say that for us at KDAP, the KDU project in particular has always been a very important recruiting pool because we knew there would be qualified people who knew Qt already. Mm -hmm. And then there are numerous contributors to Qt to, who provide uh, fixes uh, um, and e even develop whole new features, sometimes whole new, new modules for Qt, who are not 
on cute companies' payroll. They don't, so they don't get to pay to contribute. They do it for the love of the technology and obviously because they are enthusiastic software developers. Um, but of course, um, their pay is getting their code uh, made available to millions of cute users. And if this ceases by way of open governance not being available anymore, if it takes a year for their fixes to be made available to the general public, then obviously these people would have no motivation anymore to develop uh, the cute product for free. Yes. And other than being a key part of the recruitment process, what does it mean specifically for KDAB? Well, we have to say that uh, KDAP's loyalty, of course, is with its staff and with its customers. Um, we, have, we have a lot of uh, cute contributors ourselves, um, so the open governance process is very important for our guys, um, for our developers, um, but also for our, for our customers, even though the majority of our customers uh, certainly um, uses the commercial version, which is uh, by and large feature equivalent with the open source version. Um, they rely uh, on Qt being available on a very wide possible base. Uh, again, m the more people who develop on, on a, a tool or an environment, the more, the more features get developed, the more bugs get fi fixed, the more security holes get plugged. So that's simply faster evolution. And the ecosystem itself is what many of our customers, what has attracted many of our customers to Qt in the first place, because they see it's not just dependent on one single legal entity that could get acquired or, or, or disappear for other reasons, but that there is this large base of developers uh, worldwide that um, moves the project ahead. And if that were to disappear, then Q just becomes less attractive and uh, people would be looking at alternatives more. Yeah. And where do you think this is going? Our business uh, success here at KDAP, of course, is um, very tightly coupled to Qt's business success. And Qt's success, in turn, is very tightly coupled to um, the open governance process. So we will do whatever we can to support the um, uh, continued existence and livelihood of the open governance process. We're very happy to see that the Qt company recently stated in a blog post that they remain committed to open source software, uh, but there is very, both at KDAP and in other communities that um, we are in very close contact with, um, that uh, things might change for the worse. This is partly fueled by a decision made a couple of months ago by the Qt company to make the long-term service releases not available to open source users anymore and also to make Qt accounts mandatory. So that blog post in itself has not entirely removed all the worry that there is about the future of Qt. So we can see why there are still some seeds of doubt. What are your final thoughts? So um, we're confident, though, that an agreement can be reached eventually between the Qt company and the KDE Free Qt Foundation, and that the Qt company continues to embrace the benefits from a living ecosystem. And I should also say that uh, as of now, this ecosystem is very much alive. Thank you very much for your time, Kala. Thank you, Robert. Have you ever wondered if your smart TV could be spying on you and would have liked to do something about it? A few weeks ago, KDE released the beta version of their KDE Plasma Big Screen, an open source UI for smart TVs. It's built on top of KDE and Q Technologies sharing a lot of code with the Plasma desktop experience, yet presenting the user with a radically different interface and input system. It provides an easy-to-use interface, optimized for remote control usage, as well as voice interaction, thanks to an optional integration with the open-source Mycroft Voice Assistant. You'll find more information on plasma-bigscreen.org, 
which will be in the description section below. Last week, Qt released a new version of Qt for MCU. Apart from extended documentation, it brings support for five new development boards from NXP and STM. Also, it introduces a new resource system for greater flexibility on how assets are included in your application. And it comes with text previews of free RTOS and Qt charts for MCU's support. Learn more in the release linked below. Now, for a little bit about how we can be more helpful to the frontline medics and scientists. I'm sure you've already been reading in the news about people helping with regards to personal protection equipment, or PPE for short. Everyone using 3D printers to either print face shields or mask holders. I won't bore you further with news about those events, but will reiterate the importance of getting into organized groups or even joining an existing group. Simply printing these at home and then walking to your nearest hospital, care home or doctor's office will only be putting yourself and the workers at risk. As an example, I joined the National 3D Printing Society. What they do is make sure the STL or printing file is a version that will be accepted further down the line. There have been people that jumped in too quickly without looking and invested time and money to print thousands of face shields that couldn't be accepted. So this is the first issue you won't have to worry about. Next, they have organized logistics to first control the sterilization of the printed items. Remember the part where I said simply dropping them off could put you and others at risk? This gets rid of that risk by making sure it meets proper medical requirements. Lastly, a step that is also all too often ignored, they distribute them. This is important because this organized handing out of resources means they know who needs what and who got what. So find an organized 3D printing group near you and get printing. Just take the STL file and print. Then get a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling inside. What's that? You don't have a 3D printer and want to feel warm and fuzzy. Or you have one but want to feel more warm and fuzzy. Right, so there is something else you can do. You can fold at home. <laughs> no, 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 not the clean clothes that have been sitting on the side for two days. So folding at home, as quoted from their site, is a distributed computing project for simulating protein dynamics. Why is this important now? Well, they are using all the extra computing power we can provide to help fight COVID-19. You can have a look for yourself on the link below. And hopefully, a quick search will also show you that a few heavy hitters have already joined in the fight. There, all warm and fuzzy. Next, in our announcements uh, this month, as we know, many events have been cancelled, postponed, or shifted to virtual formats. After Qt World Summit 2020 had been postponed to October 2020, now it's been announced that a Qt Virtual Tech Con will take place on the 12th and 13th of May. There will be 36 live talks for designers, developers, and technology managers, from beginners all the way up to professionals. And registration is free. Also, this year's KDE Academy will happen completely virtually from September 4th to 11th. Participants will showcase, discuss, and plan the future of the community and its technology. Academy 2020 will begin with virtual training sessions on Friday 4th of September. This will be followed by a number of talk sessions held on Saturday 5th of September and Sunday 6th of September. The remaining five days will be filled with workshops and breakout sessions. Due to their respective evolution, Qt often followed, and still follows, some design idioms that feel unnatural to the usual C++ developer. 
Kedab's Ivan Chukic describes some ways to work with it in his recent article, Qt, Range Based for Loops and Structured Bindings. Check it out below. Thanks again for watching. Stay safe and feel free to share any feedback below the video while you're 3D printing or folding at home. See you next time.